Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us here at the Global Health Colloquium. We really appreciate all of your time. And it is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Marissa Micah. Uh, Dr. Micah is the former head of humanities and social sciences at the University of Global Health Equity. And she's currently on sabbatical to finish up her book manuscript, which I understand should be forthcoming in uh, fall of 2021. And that's entitled Africanizing Oncology, Creativity, Crisis, and Cancer in Uganda. Dr. Micah completed her PhD in the history of science at the University of Pennsylvania and also holds an MHS in international health from the Johns Hopkins University. So uh, if you could all join me in giving Dr. Micah a warm welcome. Uh, she will present her talk and then we will um, have questions and answers at the end. So if you could um, enter your questions in the Q&A field, that will be active throughout the talk. Um, and then we will um, pose the questions to her after um, she finishes her presentation. So Dr. Micah, thank you so much for coming. Um, Dr. Moorfield, thank you so much for having me. And I just wanted to, again, thank all of you for being here um, on November 20th in what feels like the longest 2020 uh, that one can imagine. And so I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, I'm really, uh, I, it's just a thrill. Um, I've been in a writing cave for most of the uh, for for most of this year, and um, it's just always a pleasure to step out of it and talk about writing uh, rather than being in that echo chamber. Um, so I just want to briefly, before I forget, I just want to tell you that all of the photographs that you're going to see today in this presentation. Um, their permissions are in place to share them with you if they're not in the public domain. Um, the historical photographs, most of them are from Dr. John Ziegler, who was the founding head of the Uganda Cancer Institute in the 1960s. All of the contemporary photographs are taken by either myself uh, or my colleague, who's a photographer, Andrea Stoltens. Um, and so I just want you to, I just wanted to flag that to you. Um, and I'm going to be reading to stick to time, uh, but I will try to make this interactive and interesting as well. So over the past decade, cancer has emerged as a far more politically and, epi and epidemiologically visible phenomenon to African public health authorities and global health specialists alike. This increasingly visible cancer burden joins a host of chronic ailments, including hypertension, heart disease, stroke, renal disease, kidney failure, uh, diabetes, liver disease, mental health issues. These chronic conditions join a high burden of infectious diseases, including HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, alongside epidemics of violence and injury creating what many South African epidemiologists have called a quadruple disease burden, or as Emile Mendenhall would put it, a crisis of syndemics. Now, this increasingly visible chronic disease burden is shaped by a number of factors. Urbanization, mm -hmm. consumption, and affluence are rapidly reshaping the burden of non-communicable diseases in the global South. Particularly on the African continent, the ways in which HIV sh AIDS shapes comorbidities is also a major issue. Um, and I'm sure that many of you have read Julie Livingston's Improvising Medicine, um, which takes place in Botswana and very vividly shows the way in which HIV and cancer have these synergies. Um, as HIV positive patients uh, live longer on antiretroviral therapy, they're also more vulnerable to developing infection related cancers, particularly cervical cancer. So this increasing and increasingly visible cancer burden also demands care. And publicly funded cancer wards are opening across Africa from Botswana to Kenya to Rwanda. And joining Livingston, uh, Daria Jorovic is writing a really wonderful ethnography of cancer in Rwanda. Um, Benson Mulemi's work on Kenya, uh, Megan Vaughn's working on a very wonderful synthetic history of questioning the epidemiological transition in Africa. 
Um, farther afield, if you go to India, there's a very rich group of scholars uh, such as Carlo Cadiff, Dwight Banerjee, um, and Cecilia Van Hollen, who are all doing really interesting work on care and cancer in contemporary times. Now, in Uganda, similarly, cancer is an increasingly visible issue. Uh, but in contrast to some of these other sites in Africa, uh, in Uganda, public oncology services have a long and rich history that's rooted in cancer and infectious disease research. And in contrast to African public oncology wars that have really started to open in the past 10 years in the wake of HIV AIDS, uh, the Uganda Cancer Institute, which I'm going to be talking to you about today, is over 50 years old. And I just want to locate us just so that we know where we are today. Uh, I'm going to be talking primarily from the vantage point of Mulago Hill here in Kampala. Um, and so just want to orient you to that. And this is the Uganda Cancer Institute as it was in 1967, um, just to give you a sense of this long history. Now, for the past 50 years, Uganda has served as what Helen Tilly might call Africa's living laboratory for producing knowledge about cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this was the Lymphoma Treatment Center 50 years ago, the UCI 50 years ago. This was the Lymphoma Treatment Center in 2012. Uh, as you can see, building is pretty much the same. Uh, patients are there as well. This is the UCI as it is in part today. Now, the UCI's current slogan, Research is Our Resource, reflects the history of the fact that the UCI started as an experimental chemotherapy research facility. Um, and in contemporary times, by framing research as a resource that can be tapped and utilized, the current director of the UCI, Dr. Jackson Oren, and his colleagues are gesturing to a contemporary landscape of medical research and development partnerships in the country. Research is our resource is suggestive of a scenario wherein research conducted at the Institute can bring more resources for cancer, as has been the case over the past 50 years. And I'll just flag some examples of this to you. Research at the UCI generated knowledge about the curability of cancer with cytotoxic agents alone in the 1960s and 1970s. In the 1980s and 1990s, large numbers of patients with HIV-related Carposi's sarcoma provided an indispensable source of clinical material on neoplastic diseases and AIDS. And in the 2000s, with newfound interests in the relationship between infections and cancers, the Institute is once again an attractive site for research. The collective commitment of turning research into a resource for care explains in part the remarkable durability and resilience of this institution over the past 50 years. Um, so as I said, I've been writing a book about the history of the UCI over the past 50 year or over, over the past decade, but the book itself traces this 50 year history. And one of the ways that the gloss that I've chosen to kind of describe or kind of encapsulate this history is this idea of Africanizing oncology. And this is my gloss for explaining how a small experimental chemotherapy clinical trials unit has been transformed into a site of oncological excellence in the present. The book explores the processes and methods by which physician research researchers, especially Ugandans, refashioned the resources of oncological technologies and biomedical research agendas for Ugandan patients and caretakers. And Africanization also speaks to a very particular historical moment, the moment of independence in Uganda in 1962. And I think that this commemorative stamp, um, this stamp was released in Uganda uh, as part of independence celebration, you know, kind of visually captures what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Africanizing oncology. In the back here, there's the very modern new Mulago Hospital completed in 1962. There's a female x-ray technician very carefully draped in a lead apron using this x-ray machine for a patient. Um, and 
yeah, I think that this, this image really speaks to what I'm trying to get at when I talk about Africanizing oncology. Um, to give you a sense of the overview of the book, it's, it's largely organized across chronological time. Uh, so it begins with kind of the prehistory of cancer research in Uganda um, with, uh, with discussing the early history of Burkitt's lymphoma research. Um, it then goes into being a hospital built from scratch. So talking about the actual founding of the UCI. Um, then we discuss, then I discuss uh, the survival of the UCI during times of Idi Amin. Uh, then there's a period of the 1970s up to 2000 or late 1970s up to 2005, um, where I look at practices of chemotherapy technologies and how those re really were changed by the war and by structural adjustment and scarcity. I'll be talking about that a fair amount today, actually. Um, and then there are two kind of more contemporary chapters, one about the material technopolitics of radiotherapy, um, and then one about the Lymphoma Treatment Center and the UCI in the present from 2010 to 2015 or so. The book has a hard stop at 2015. So many things have changed at the UCI since I started working there. And so I want you to bear in mind that everything that you're hearing today is historical. Uh, most of it does not reflect some sort of contemporary feeling if you were to walk onto the UCI's campus at this present day moment. Um, and there's a strategy to that. And I'll talk about that in, my, in the reading of the afterword that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, so, and just to give you a sense of the methods that have been used that, to shape this project, um, this is truly a multidisciplinary project. Uh, I'm trained as a historian, but also as an anthropologist, and I also have a background in public health, um, and all of those different pieces have come together. So there was archival research that went into this. This is a photograph of the UCI's uh, archive as it was. Of course, I also went to places in the United Kingdom and the US as well. Uh, I conducted approximately 50 oral histories with individuals who had worked at the UCI over time. Um, and so this is a photograph of a field research trip that we took uh, out to meet the, one of the individuals um, who was responsible for patient follow-up and for administration of the Cancer Institute in the 1970s. Uh, and then lastly, there was a lot of hospital ethnography uh, that went into the work for this project. Um, so I spent most days uh, for some amount of time uh, working as an ethnographer on the wards, uh, rather than trying to get an ethnographic kind of picture of cancer care or what it means to be a cancer patient, um, I was tuned into doing ethnographic work as a way to find a gateway into the past. Um, so I spent a lot of time shadowing physicians. Uh, you may note that this is a pediatric ward. I was working quite consistently in pediatrics um, and I wanted to make sure um, that uh, and I wanted to make sure um, that I was not kind of in over my head projecting what it would mean to be a pediatric cancer patient on these wards. And so I will say that most of the actual research that I wound up doing was with adults, um, whether those adults were uh, whether those adults um, were patient caretakers or if they were uh, people who worked at the Institute as well. Sorry, I see that there are already Q and A's and I'm getting distracted by those. So uh, from what I understand, we hold questions to the end. Um, so let me give you the roadmap for the rest of the talk. Um, I'll lay out some of the core arguments of the book for you. Uh, I'll talk about the early days of the UCI. Uh, then we'll go into kind of a history of chemotherapy administration and experiences in the 1980s and 1990s. 
And then I'll bring us up into the early 2012s to talk about how some of those things have changed. Um, I'll talk a bit about personal protective gear. I'm sure that PPE is on many of your minds. I'll talk about a demolition story um, and then I'll read uh, a bit of the books afterward to you. Um, so just to give you a sense of core arguments that are driving this project, many of them are derived from conversations in STS, fused with medical anthropology, and then given a special African history contextualization. Um, so there are kind of three interrelated arguments that the book makes. The first is that cancer research and experiments have shaped the built and social infrastructure for cancer care in Uganda over the past 50 years. And I use the term experimental infrastructure to describe the constellation of physical facilities, research questions, care practices, data collection procedures, and human labor that make research and care function on a day-to-day -day basis at the UCI. And so I'm gonna be talking a lot about the Lymphoma Treatment Center today, uh, which is the pediatric ward of the UCI. And I'll be talking about it as an experimental infrastructure. Now, the second argument is that many of oncology's treatment technologies originally came to Uganda through international research partnerships or as gifts. So that is chemotherapy initially came from outside sources such as like National Cancer Institute, British Empire Cancer Campaign. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about the circulation and traffic of chemotherapy today. However, <laughs> I have read Clapperton Mavunga on, in, on incoming technologies. I don't want you to somehow think that technology somehow resides in the West and Sub-Saharan Africa is somehow the place that has practice. No, I'm not thinking with that binary. Um, I've been very interested in techniques of maintenance, of repair, of tinkering. And I'm really interested in the ways in which oncology and its technologies become vernacular in this context. That is, how do people harness these technologies and transform these materials from international research collaborations to serve Ugandan publics? Um, and for those of you who are interested in kind of theories of repair, I really highly recommend an article by Stephen Jackson um, that gets into this in really beautiful ways. Um, and lastly, and this is, uh, is probably speaking more to the historians in the room, um, if you look at Ugandan historiography, it's very dominated by discussions of ethnicity, land, kinship, kingship. Um, and what I'm trying to do in this book is to argue, actually, we can tell a really rich and interesting social history from a cancer hospital. Um, and I think that the UCI offers a really unique vantage point for considering the relationships between politics and science. And so I treat the hospital as a microcosm of political, scientific, economic, and social life in Uganda and independence. And I hope that you'll see that quite clearly today uh, when I talk about the reverberations of the war in Uganda in 1978 in 1979 and how that really transformed people's experiences and understandings of chemotherapy afterwards. So I want to take you into the founding first of this uh, experimental infrastructure into the UCI in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, as I said, you've seen this photograph before. Um, the Uganda Cancer Institute opened in 1967 at the top of Mulago Hill in Kampala. It originally began as a Burkitt's Lymphoma Treatment Chemotherapy Clinical Trials Center. Uh, and the individuals who are here in the photograph um, are actually uh, the kind of first Burkitt's Lymphoma patients who were treated at this institute. Um, from the beginning, this was a joint effort the Ugandan Makerere Medical School's Department of Surgery, the American National Cancer Institute, and the British Empire Cancer Campaign all contributed funds and pools to start this project. Um, wanted to give you a little bit of context about Burkitt's lymphoma. So Burkitt's lymphoma is a rapidly growing 
and grossly disfiguring common pediatric cancer. Um, it tends to be uh, more highly prevalent in places where malaria is also highly prevalent. Uh, it's also highly responsive to chemotherapy treatments um, that were already in experimental and everyday use in oncology centers in the global north in the 1960s. And some of the drugs that I'm talking about in case there are oncologists in the room um, are cyclophosphamide and methotrexate, eventually vincristine. Um, and the individual that you see here is the Irish surgeon and Dennis Burkett, um, who's often attributed uh, with the discovery of this disease. Uh, that's simply not the case. If you're really curious, the book is coming out in 2021 and you can have like a whole different uh, take on Dennis Burkett um, and, uh, and that history. So, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the actual materiality of the lymphoma treatment center is, itself. Um, it was a former maternity ward on Mulago's campus. It had been abandoned when services were moved to New Mulago, which was that building in the background of that slide that I showed, or of that postage stamp that I showed you in a former slide. Um, and the Ugandan Ministry of Health, uh, when it came to be, when they came to decide, you know, well, where is this place going to be? Uh, the UCI, this maternity ward, was given as a gift to the UCI. Uh, it was dilapidated, it was rat infested, it was a shell of a ward to turn into a research space, and it took about six months of planning and procurement and painting uh, to serve, the, to turn this into a lymphoma treatment center. And from the beginning, these, uh, this LTC, this Lymphoma Treatment Center, was very much modeled on an American pediatric cancer ward. Um, you know, so really drawing from practices and experiences from the National Cancer Institute. Um, patients and patient caretakers radically transformed both the scope and practice of that site, or rather of of what a cancer ward was supposed to be. And I talk about that quite a bit in my book and I'm happy to talk about that more in Q and A. Um, and, but what I wanna to highlight to you here is that you know, from its inception in 1967, chemotherapy, be it administering the drugs, managing the side effects um, or, and documenting whether or not drugs created durable cancer remissions, that was the purpose and that really defined why the UCI was here. Um, and I just want you to take a look at this chemotherapy laboratory because we're going to be looking a little bit at how chemo practices of mixing changed over time. So, you know, you can see there's a window here for ventilation. Uh, this nurse is mixing what I believe is doxorubicin or the red devil in kind of a glass, uh, in a glass jar here. This is Paul Carbone, in case any of you are oncology history nerds. Um, Paul Carbone was a pretty famous uh, NCI chemotherapist. But just look at how well stocked everything is here. Um, you know, this is very much like a well provisioned laboratory. Uh, and also, I just want to note that, you know, the safety situation here. Uh, it's not so great, you know, where are the gloves, where are the masks, why aren't you wearing protective gear, this stuff is carcinogenic, I mean, just look at these sandals. Um, so that, you know, kind of brings us into the scene a little bit. Um, so in the 19, in 1971, Idi Amin Dada took over Uganda in a coup. Uh, in 1972, he declared an economic war uh, which led to the expulsion of the Asian population in Uganda and led to a lot of Mzungu anxiety about whether to stay or to go. Uh, and in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, American expatriate staff decided to leave the Uganda Cancer Institute. In the book, I talk a lot about the politics and kind of early ethos and ethics of Ugandanizing oncology. And so right from the beginning, uh, when the NCI arrived at the UCI, 
um, they made a decision that they were definitely going to be training Ugandans substantially. Uh, they designated at that time uh, an extraordinary human being named Dr. Charles Oweni uh, to serve as the first and for a long time the only oncologist in Uganda. Um, Oweni was actually in the United States in Bethesda in a fellowship program uh, when he received a call from his colleagues saying, you know, if you if you don't come home now, like there's not going to be a whole lot to return to. Um, and what's really extraordinary about this is that rather than shuttering the Institute in the 1970s, Olweni and his colleagues uh, produced a decade's worth of data about the long-term survival and cure rates for Burkitt's lymphoma patients. They continued to do patient outreach to far corners. Uh, Idi Amin was very interested in this site as a showcase of the Africanization of science in Uganda. Um, so he would often bring international visitors. Uh, and again, I talk about this much more in the book and I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A as well. Um, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about what happened to chemotherapy and experiences of it and mixing of it and, crew and kind of administration of it after Amin left. Uh, and also after the NCI decided to pull funding from the Institute at the end of the 1970s. Um, so between 1978 and 1979, Amin's regime was overthrown in a war. Uh, and I know, I'm sure that we may have some Tanzanians as well as Ugandans in this audience. Uh, and both will have different definitions of what that war was. I'm just going to call it the war. Uh, Mulago Hospital itself became a war hospital and it was hit particularly hard. And from the 1980s onwards, civil war, structural adjustment and HIV AIDS all shaped the reconstruction of Ugandan healthcare services. Now, revitalizing chemotherapy clinical trials and research on cancer in Uganda was not a priority. The sporadic availability and frequent absence of drugs due to limited government drug procurement budgets, rather than the continuous presence of freely available chemotherapy, thanks to sponsorship from, the, from sponsored clinical trials, really just defined work at the UCI from the early 1980s up until the late 2000s. And one of the really interesting things, uh, and I, and I, um, most of this interview, most of this information is derived um, from an interview with Margaret Nakaketo, uh, who worked at the UCI in the 1980s and 1990s, and is now a very prominent pediatrician in Uganda. Um, and this is also uh, chemotherapy nurses who worked at the UCI at the time will also tell you many of these same stories. And that is that in the 1980s and 1990s on the wards of the UCI, the violent effects of chemotherapy technologies were equated with the collective experience of violence during the war between 1978 and 1979. And as Dr. Nakaketo remembers, when there was the war in Uganda, the Tanzanians, when they came for this liberation, they had this big gun, which used to throw bombs. And we called it Saba Saba. And so the patients had named this drug Saba Saba. The chemotherapy, it would hit them. The hair goes out. The next day, they are anemic, they are weak. Some would vomit when hit by the drug, so they called it Saba Saba. Nobody told you they would really come for their Saba Saba and it would really hit them. And as Nakakato recalled this story, she emphatically and rhythmically snapped her fingers to punctuate the way that chemotherapy treatments violently hit the body. Administered through a push injection, the drugs feel like a thunderous clap. The blood counts crash. The eruptive vomiting comes. Eyebrows, eyelashes, pubic hair, and the hair on one's head come out in clumps. And for those living in Kampala during this time, Saba Saba hit buildings, farmland, roads, and radio towers. Those who remember Saba Saba remember rockets were different colors. Pinks, greens, blues, and smoky grays painted evening skies. 
When Saba Saba was fired, it let out a terrifying, tearing, screeching sound. Germans called these rocket launchers Stalin's organ because of this particularly harsh and terrible sound in World War II. So chemotherapy treatments as Saba Saba connected the booming of bodies on the wards of the UCI to the broader experiences of the body politic in the 1980s and 1990s. Bombing a targeted area with devastating effect and little precision, what Katusha rockets are made for can be extended to describe in general, not in all cases, the style of oncology practice at the UCI from the mid eighties onwards to maybe early 2000s. The end of randomized trials and regular drug supplies meant that nurses and oncologists were left to bombard the body with whatever happened to be sporadically available. And this practice worked directly against the logic and findings of approximately a decade and a half of research conducted at the Institute on the importance of drug combinations in chemotherapy treatments. What does it mean that on the wards of the UCI, chemotherapy treatments became synonymous with Saba Saba? It was a joke on the wards to a certain extent. Patients would come for their rounds of poisoning and after arriving early in the morning for blood work to ensure that their white cell counts were adequate and that their livers were in working order, patients would either be admitted onto a bed and receive their drugs, or they would sit on a hard wooden chair in the outpatient areas of the, ST, of the solid tumors treatment center and the lymphoma treatment center, which doubled as reception areas and nursing break areas. It's time for your Saba Saba was a moment of levity as nurses would look for veins on the hands of patients to insert cannulas and then push in vincristine, cyclophosphamide, and methotrexate. And although I worked in interviews on the, and on the wards to elicit greater reflection on what calling chemotherapy treatment Saba Saba meant for cancer patients and their care providers in the 1980s and 1990s at the UCI, the conversation stopped shortly after confirming that cancer chemotherapy treatments were indeed equated with, with rocket launchers and that the war continued and that the war and instability and violence in everyday life was just part of life in Kampala. In one such conversation about chemotherapy administration, Sisti Mary Kalinacci, a longtime nursing sister who worked starting in 1977 or so, she recently retired to work as a study nurse at the time of the research, um, grabbed my left hand while we were talking and she said, oh, this is so nice. And I thought she was referring to my wedding ring. And I said, oh, well, thank you. You know, I really like my wedding bean. Or uh, I really like my wedding ring. And she said, no, no, dear, I'm admiring your veins. These are very, very nice veins for Ivy Canulas. And I think it was much easier to just, to just simply discuss a practice like the administration of a, like the insertion of a cannula and the administration of chemotherapy rather than to speak directly to an experience of war. I think calling chemotherapy Saba Saba in the 1980s and 1990s was a way to talk about what it means to live through catastrophe and disorder. Chemotherapy as Saba Saba suggests a sudden explosive moment of chaos the body under the power of chemotherapy is ungovernable, eruptive, and impossible to rein in. But it's also a fleeting moment of chaos. It's a punctuated catastrophe. It's an episode of violence. Saba Saba hits, and then it passes. And I think calling chemotherapy Saba Saba provided an additional cue for patients. If you could survive the war, then surely you could survive six rounds of poisoning. Cancer patients in the 1980s and 1990s had already survived a war. They had lived through years of misrule under Idi Amin. They could also survive if they just held out through the booms of Saba Saba injections. There's a much broader kind of back to this idea of you know, traveling technologies. The, of course, there's a broader Cold War weapons story here. And there's also a story of kind of 
war and the manufacturing of chemotherapy in World War II, World War I and World War II don't have time to go into it here, um, but I just want to flag that chemotherapy and rocket launching technologies are both products of secret wartime research and, de and development in World War I and World War II. Both chemotherapy and rocket launchers came to East Africa in the 1960s and 1970s through securitist routes and on, far, and on the margins of broader geopolitics and cleavages of the Cold War. Um, and the meaning and to some extent the purpose of these relatively old military technologies were refashioned by East African users on cancer wards and liberation fronts alike. So. So let's go to more contemporary times to the lymphoma treatment center as it was in 2012. In the 1980s and 1990s and early 2000s, the Uganda Cancer Institute served primarily as a palliative care site for patients living with HIV related cancers. And up until recently, the 40 original beds of the Institute provided public oncology goods for a population catchment of about 40 million living in the Great Lakes region. And as I said earlier, the site is undergoing, is undergoing a profound renaissance in order to become, in the current words of the director, Jax Norum, a center of research excellence. And so this is the LTC in 2012, uh, when the bulk of ethnographic research for this book was conducted. Now, since 2009, the chemotherapy procurement budget for the UCI shifted from less than 20 million Ugandan shillings a year to approximately 7 billion Ugandan shillings a year. Okay, these are old numbers. I'm sure that they're outdated at this point, um, but the number that I'll give you is that when I would ask colleagues what their total operating budget was for the UCI in the 1980s, 1990s, it was about $7,000 a year. Um, if there is a colleague who's in here today from the, Ugand from the UCI, um, perhaps we can get what the current number is, but just know that uh, operating budgets are much, much higher. Unfortunately, that number has fallen out of my head, but it's a big number. The Institute grew from 20 to over 200 employees in a few short years. And this led to many issues about how to transform practice and build institutional cohesion at the UCI redefining practices of administering chemotherapy and disposing of it became a major issue. For years, nurses had run a makeshift outpatient unit for patients who were trickling in with their own drugs into the UCI's reception area. But with upwards of 100 outpatients a day coming for infusions, there were new investments, an additional treatment space, a chemotherapy reconstitution hood, and the dedicated training of pharmacists. Um, and, but nevertheless, when I was working at the UCI in 2012 and chemotherapy mixing looks dramatically different now, um, there were a lot of questions about, well, how do we scale our chemotherapy mixing, uh, our chemotherapy mixing and administration protocols? So this is the Lymphoma Treatment Center in 2012. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, I think that sometimes there's a way in which we can think of medical spaces in, sub, in parts of Africa as, as places of scarcity or lack. This is not a space of scarcity or lack. There's a lot going on here. This is oral morphine. This is liquid saline. Uh, these, you know, there's a really great box full of gloves here of all different sizes. Here's a waste disposal that's been set up. Here is the procedures chair. I hope you can see my laser pointer, which I'm so excited about. Um, here in the back, there is a medical consultation in progress. This is a consultation room. Here's a patient file. This green paper that you see here is just all sorts of different information about how to administer chemotherapy and how to remember how to mix properly. This is a medical waste disposal unit. This is a nursing sister. Here is 
her workspace. Uh, and if you notice this IV pole in the back, I believe that is for a patient who is sitting behind here. So this is a space of a lot of abundance. Uh, and one of the really interesting things here is to think about kind of, and this is an image of the chemotherapy administration uh, area itself. Patients come in with different drugs and orders. So here are the different, uh, here are the different receipts or rather the different uh, orders in place, uh, the different administration tools that you'll use, lots of cotton, lots of drugs. Um, you might notice why is she putting, why is she pushing saline out into a bucket? These saline uh, containers that they have are for adult patients rather than pediatric patients. And so in order to get things to work properly, uh, you need to squeeze some of the saline out. So pediatric chemotherapy nurses usually prepare between five and 15 individual treatment orders on any given afternoon. Individual nurses had particular approaches to mixing the drugs, preparing combinations, and then administering them. Some nurses clumped the orders together by type of cancer, preparing the same cocktail for Burkitt's lymphoma patients, and then focusing uh, on individual cancers. Other nurses would mix a combination and then administer it before moving on to the next patient. So, there's a, so depending on who you are, depending on what kind of chemotherapy nurse you are, you, you're, you're going to have your own kind of techni techniques and technologies of practice uh, for putting together these mixes. Uh, the end result was largely the same, however. By the late afternoon, there would be a chorus of vomiting on the ward. Patient caretakers would shuffle in and out of the LTC, holding big buckets of sickness, depositing them on the front lawn or in the toilets in the back. So throughout my time at the UCI, there were ongoing concerns about safety, toxicity, and the violence of these chemicals in a setting where the number of patients and the volume of orders oh, quite consistently exceeded human capability. Nurses were managing the sheer volume of these patients at considerable risk and hazard to themselves, working in a place where ventilation was questionable and reliable protective gear was coming in and out of the loop, was coming in and out of focus. Um, and remember what I talked about with, in terms of like gifts and incoming, technolo incoming oncology technologies, uh, I just want to share a vignette from July 2012, when the head pharmacist of the UCI, Mr. B, received a phone call from an old college friend. This friend now worked at a Kampala office of World Vision at, at the Kampala office of World Vision Uganda. And someone had just donated a thousand pieces of Kendall chemo block chemotherapy custom kit gear. And the janitorial staff at this office were using the gloves, the masks, and the gowns on their cleaning rounds rather than using it to mix or administer cytotoxic drugs. So would the UCI want this gift instead? Mr. B said, of course. And a few days later, what was left of the thousand pieces of chemo block gear, which were custom packaged for the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, arrived at the veranda of the Institute's LTC. Now, after the donation of the chemo block protective gear in that summer of 2012, the sartorial politics and concerns about health worker safety uh, kind of radically shifted. On the day the new outfits arrived, I was surprised to see my chemotherapy mixing colleagues decked out from head to toe in bright blue protective gear. Usually they were in plastic aprons and lightweight masks and in a single layer of latex gloves. And I spent a lot of time shadowing that day. And the head of nursing came in and chided me at one point for not wearing anything protective, even though I had observed mixing at this reception table numerous times with nothing. On that day, the quote was, these drugs are toxic. What are you doing here without a mask? And it was a sound observation, of course. I was standing in an open hallway without a face mask while my colleagues reconstituted drugs at the reception table, Marissa put on a mask. So I grumbled a bit, I put one on. 
It was immediately hot and uncomfortable, rubbing up against the rim of my glasses. And I thought to myself, wow, this reception area has been, is, you know, exactly the same as it, as it usually is. But yet today is a very different day for thinking about protection. Now, these nurses are professionals. The sister here started mixing and administering a chemotherapy five years uh, before um, I came to the work at the UCI. She's never had an accident. These nurses are pragmatic. Um, if, there, if there is a nurse who is pregnant, they are barred from administering chemotherapy as a safety precaution. Uh, these nurses are also sometimes patients, at least two, possibly three long-term chemotherapy nurses and several members of the x-ray department were treated at the Institute for Cancer between 2010 and 2017. In retrospect, this personal protective equipment, the double gloves, the heavy masks, the thick blue plastic gowns, all manufactured in the USA, this created a visual focal point for discussing invisible harms. This gifting, or was it dumping, opened a space in which one could discuss the challenges, fears, and inconsistencies that accompany mixing and administering cytotoxic drugs in this setting. So, over the time that I worked at the Lymphoma Treatment Center at the Uganda Cancer Institute, I knew that the building that I was working in was slated for, de for demolition. Uh, the experimental infrastructure had kind of grown out and beyond capacity, and there were new plans. Um, and so it really only took about half a day to bulldoze this building. It came down very easily. The bricks and the plaster and the fish mural of cartoon seahorses swimming in the sea and the anthropomorphic starfish all crumbled into a fine powdery dust. The windows and the gates and the iron doors were salvaged and piled up behind the Institute's generator. And staff were reminded in internal sticky memos, in internal memos sticky taped on the wall, that they were not to reuse these old materials for their own construction needs. People quietly cried and took pictures of their old, decrepit, beloved LTC. As one nurse said, it was the heart and soul of the Institute. Patients and their caretakers watched the building crunch and crumble from a newly improvised temporary space, a refurbished, a, 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 a refurbished tuberculosis, tuberculosis outpatient facility with three airless rooms where you could shove in about seven full-size beds and a few floor cases apiece, and a hallway which had been hastily enclosed to accommodate pediatric cribs. The reception table which had also doubled as a chemotherapy constitution bench in the old LTC, was repurposed outside of the corridors as a place for patients to lean against and store their bedrolls, washing bins, and buckets. So a new three-story outpatient treatment facility now stands, quite literally, on the side of the old LTC, with state-of-the-art chemotherapy mixing stations, a luxuriously plush chemotherapy administ luxurious, luxur luxuriously plush chemotherapy administration chairs and plenty of sharps disposal containers, palatial laboratory workspaces, and multiple freezers for biomedical samples. This all marks a new era of researching the relationship between cancers and infectious diseases in Uganda. Demolishing the old LTC has also, in a sense, demolished longstanding practices of mixing and administering chemotherapy on the wards. And so I think that I'm hoping that through this discussion of kind of shifting chemotherapy practices, the materiality of this experimental infrastructure and how it changes, um, kind of the role of politics and the way those shape experiences or rather political events come to be experienced within the body politic at this institute give you a sense um, of kind of the broader arguments of the book. Um, I'm gonna take a brief sip of water before I conclude. So I'd like to read um, 
and again, just to kind of remind us of what I'm talking about here in terms of Africanizing oncology. Um, in closing, I'd like to read from the afterword of my book. Uh, and this is uh, something that I've drafted the past weekend. So it's very fresh writing, um, but, and, but I hope that you'll appreciate the provocation and, and, uh, and kind of the, the writing itself. So academic knowledge production is a glacial affair. And most of the intellectual architecture for this book was built a decade ago. It was informed by discussion of experiments traveling from Adriana Petrina, the promises and the shortcomings of the antiretroviral techno fix for HIV, and think of Joao Biel's work or DDA Fassan's work, the material and the material realities of biomedicine in Africa. Nancy Hunt has called this debris. Wenzel Geisler and colleagues have called these traces. Anne Stoller would call them ruins. Julie Livingston would call it improvisation. Noemi Toussaint would call it capacity. Uh, Johanna Crane would call it scrambling for Africa. Helen Tilly would call it a living laboratory. You know, this was really as the zeitgeist of like the late 2000s, early 2010s, right? And I imagine that if I were shaping this book today, the research questions, the methods, and indeed the zeitgeist would be pretty different. Um, during a particularly dark moment in my field work, an American colleague, after listening to me, said just, he said, Marissa, just write your truth. And I have endeavored to do so in these pages. In the early days of writing this book, as I revisited my field notes and interviews and archival materials, I was struck by the personal, the intimate, and the politically fraught. And I made the decision that I would respect and maintain the privacy and confidentiality of the people who work and receive care at the UCI. Um, and that goes beyond, you know, kind of these crude measures of IRBs that we go through, right? Where it's like, well, let's go through the informed consent process through, um, through these interviews. It's like, no, well, when I listen to this interview, even if I was never asked to turn the tape recorder off, is this something that a person actually really wants me to repeat? So there would be no muckraking. If it was not already on the public record or if it was not said to me specifically on the record, I really erred on the size of caution. So my positionality as the historian ethnographer, you know, this is uh, in 2017, the UCI turned 50 years old. I helped to organize uh, some of the kind of memory celebrations that went along with this. Um, Surely this positionality has shaped the writing and analysis. Uh, and I've received pushback over the years uh, from American colleagues uh, about being heavily invested and embedded at this institution. Um, some have suggested that I've elevated health workers too much or that I've stripped out political conflicts or I've, cracked it, or I've crafted a teleological account of biomedical triumph. Uh, hagiography has never been my intention, but I also do not think we have nearly enough stories of resilience and tenacity on the record. While we have plenty of accounts of failure or exploitation or technocratic bumbling and the un and untimely death in contemporary African health settings. And so I'm not going to minimize the great bravery the very definition of heroism involved in keeping the UCI open in the 1970s, or choosing to come back to war afraid Uganda after studying, the United, after studying in the United Kingdom in the 1980s. I'm not going to discount the bravery of patients to show up for medical, for medical appointments and to endure harsh treatments, or the courage of a parent to prioritize a child over a marriage that then dissolves. And at the same time, I worry that for some of my colleagues in Uganda, there may be the opposite critique, right? That this book dwells too much on, on broken things, on the dark side of oncology, and those who die rather than those who survive. And again, this was not my intention. But I am sure that the neo-imperial power dynamics of global health, the privileges of positionality of being, you know, of the accident of my birth and all of those other things. Indeed, the whiteness of African studies, which Jean Allman, but many, many, and Zaleza and many others have 
discussed. This all, stay, this all hangs over how I write and think about pathologies, politics, and infrastructure in Africa. Um, and I think we have a long way to go to move beyond framing Africa as a space of static absence, to fully integrate Fanon's critiques of medicine and colonialism, and to really embrace the creativity of African innovators as Clapperton Mavunga has urged us to do. And it's really my hope that Ugandans will take this text and point out what I've gotten or missed as an outsider and in my interpretations of the past. I hope the people I may have inadvertently rendered invisible come forward and talk about the past and the present as they see it. And I hope that this work serves as a scaffolding for Ugandan physician intellectuals and cancer uh, survivors to tell their own stories. I've intentionally finished the book at 2015 with the opening of the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center and new government sponsored facilities at the UCI, including, the new including a new hospital and radiotherapy bunkers in order to facilitate that. Um, it's very difficult to be a historian of the present. Um, and in addition, I just want to note that this, you know, book isn't, in, isn't occurring in some sort of discursive vacuum. Uh, Charles Elwenny has written his own memoirs. There are oral histories available with NCI staff, such as John Ziegler, who founded this institute. Uh, there's, of course, Dennis Burkett's autobiography. And there are countless medical journals that reflect on the history of the UCI. And they all offer counterweights to the narrative and interpretation I've offered here. As I finish this book, the US reels from the devastating impact of the novel COVID-19 coronavirus. Over 250,000 people have died of this disease, which has revealed new, numerous cracks in the, in the healthcare system of the US and in the US itself. This illness breaks intensive care units. It preys on those with comorbidities such as hypertension and, diabe and diabetes. It reveals stark racial disparities in this country. It shows how fundamentally cruel it is that the right to health is tied to the ability to work in the United States. In the context of Donald Trump's America, it also reveals how political leadership can greatly unravel social health, destroy infrastructure, and hollow out expertise. And this is going to demand a new zeitgeist, and this is like the new zeitgeist, right? The events of 2020 remind us that pandemics, political disruption, economic precarity, and the willful gutting of institutions are not happening in some sort of far off post-colonial elsewhere. Normal emergency is here. The collapse of US hegemony and global health, the, US, the US's grimly theatrical exit from the WHO, the hollowing of meaningful disease control infrastructure, the rise of what appears to be a truly dark period of political cleavage in the US. All of this suggests to me that scholars based in the United States will be writing and thinking about power and expertise and health in the global South very differently in the decade and decades to come. We have so much to learn. And meanwhile, in Uganda, there is political protest, there is tear gas. There are also reports from colleagues at the UCI that they are still seeing patients every day. And that particularly during lockdowns in Kampala, leadership at the UCI chartered private buses so upcountry patients could still finish out their chemotherapy doses and still make it home to their farms and to their families. Even in times of coronavirus crisis, creativity continues at the UCI. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Micah. I wish we were all here in person so we could give you a rousing round of applause for that yes. wonderful talk. Um, we do have a uh, quite healthy number of questions in the Q&A, um, so I'm, I'm happy to read those. Um, and if you see, by the way, um, just to note, if you see that they wrote GHP 350, that just means that they're an undergraduate student in one of our core courses. So that's what that denotes. 
Um, so our first question was from Chino and it came uh, early on in your talk and he writes, how do you coincide predominantly Western methods of treatment for cancer, which are typically dependent on consistent accessibility to health facilities with the overwhelming lack of access to such facilities in some African countries, especially because this lack of access um, may not be simply due to a lack of physical buildings, but also due to the lack of consistent methods of transportation. That's a really great question. And I think that you've hit on one of the like million dollar questions in, um, in how one deals with providing cancer treatment in Uganda um, and elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that is the question of transport. Um, transport is something at the UCI that, uh, that colleagues have tried to um, address for years. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Initially, from the beginning of the UCI's inception, it was understood that if you didn't provide transport as part of a general package of goods for treatment and for care, um, you were never going to be able to run uh, clinical trials for chemotherapy. Um, and so at least in the early days of the UCI, uh, patients were given bus vouchers um, and, um, <clears throat> and actually whole families were given bus vouchers in order to be able to come to the Institute. Mm -hmm. Today, I mean, most people are still coming to the UCI with money out of their own pocket. Um, so the Institute sometimes provides transport support in special cases, but oftentimes not. Um, and so it remains a really big challenge. I mean, and, and I, what I would encourage you to think about is the fact that this is like, this is such a colonial infrastructural hangover of the ways in which tertiary biomedical facilities were designed, right? So you have these regional referral hospital structures located all over Uganda. I believe that, um, you know, one of the last ones was built in the mid 1970s, late 1970s. Um, there's this assumption that if you need tertiary care, you're going to get onto the bus in Gulu and make that long travel down to Mulago. Um, so it remains just, uh, it, all of this is to say that you're exactly right. Transport remains one of the biggest issues, I would say, in receiving cancer care and timely cancer care in Eastern Africa and beyond. Thank you. I see um, Dr. Tembi Chochaje has his hand raised. Unfortunately, um, given this is a webinar format, we, we don't um, have uh, participant um, speech enabled. So uh, Dr. Chochaje, if you wouldn't mind typing your question into the Q&A box, um, I can then pose it. Um, so our, our next question is from Austin and he has- Sorry to interrupt, but you don't you think it would be good to bundle uh, some questions together so that maybe more people have time to have their... Um... Sure. Okay, I, I will bundle. And then um, maybe Arbel, if you want to work on the next bundle, that would be great. <laughs> I just look okay. <laughs> While you um, bundle, I drink some water. Excellent. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Um, so... There is a question from Austin who asks, um, what are some contemporary challenges faced by oncologists in Uganda in the contemporary era that were not present upon the UCI's founding? Um, Jesse, and that sort of ties in actually with your answers to the last question. Um, Jesse asks about different types of cancers. And so she says there are certain cancers that are more prevalent in Africa than other areas of the world due to the fact that certain cancers um, uh, just affect that population disproportionately. And that actually ties in with a question we had from Jason later on. And he um, notes that he worked at the NCI in Bethesda in a pediatric cancer lab. Um, and a lot of researchers at that lab noted that many US clinical trials focused solely on drugs that had an effect on major adult cancers like lung, prostate, and breast cancers. And they neglected drugs that had an effect on pediatric cancers if they were ineffective in adults. So um, his question was if the problem of focusing on more prof profitable adult cancers is something that you've also noticed in Uganda. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, so I would say that the biggest contemporary challenge that colleagues, oncologists, nurses, lab technicians, all the rest at the UCI face um, is really the question of scale. Um, so in contrast to the UCI as it was designed in the early, in like 1960s, 
UCI was initially designed to address Burkitt's lymphoma, some kinds of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Carposti's sarcoma, uh, and then hepatocellular liver cancer. So hepatocellular cancer, a type of liver cancer um, that from what I understand is associated with hepatitis B. Scaling that, scaling those beds and scaling those services to now address issues around prostate cancer, breast cancer, stomach cancers, throat cancers, brain cancers, all the rest of it, that host that you would see, and especially cervical cancer. Uh, so both scale and diversity, I'd say biggest problems. Um, and then in terms of issues around different types of cancers, of course, at the UCI, you will see more kind of classically AIDS-related cancers. Um, so non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, cervical cancers. Um, <clears throat> so Carposi's sarcoma seems to be less and less of a problem with the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy. Um, but then those cancers are also alongside cancers so that we might associate with aging. So like breast cancer, prostate cancer, stomach cancer. Um, it's such a great question on drugs and kind of, you know, how do profitable adults kind of then kind of, uh, you know, how, how drugs then come down to kids. And that's just something that I don't know. Um, but I'm happy to link you to the pediatric oncologists at the UCI. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, um, I will bundle some other questions. So Ilya, thanks you for the talk and she, and he has, sorry. Um, he wonders about how you first became interested in examining oncology care at the UCI. Uh, Gabriella asked a question that you addressed, but I think maybe you can explore a bit more on um, how you reconcile respecting the privacy of those you're learning from with your goal of garnering information when conducting oral histories. And Brooke asks um, about the microcosm of UCI. Uh, and if it can be applied, sorry, it just, the, the questions are jumping in front of me because I believe other questions are coming in. So I'm using them. Um, if the political and social representations with, we see through the UCI, are um, limited in scope to the political and social dynamic of Uganda, or if, it, if this can be extrapolated. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna take another one or do, do you uh, want to? Oh, that's great. So I'm happy to, so I first became interested in the UCI um, really by accident. When I started graduate school, I had this whole plan that I really wanted to, um, <clears throat> write about the history of HIV research in Uganda, but from the perspective of African physicians. Um, and I felt that we had this kind of unidirectional story and I wanted to write a book about, you know, kind of the theory from the South um, and what it meant to be a Ugandan physician working in Mulago in the early 1980s. And, developing and generating knowledge about HIV that went, then went off into the world in different directions. Um, and in that process, I was looking through some papers of an old, uh, of like an old physician uh, researcher at the American Philo Philosophical Society in Philadelphia and found an annual report from 1971 for a cancer hospital in Uganda. And I was like, cancer hospital, Edia means Uganda, really? Like, I'm sure that this place isn't open anymore. Um, and then you start doing a little bit of digging and before you know it, you're walking up a hill, a little bit sweaty, meeting the director's secretary and asking if you can have a brief audience. Um, and I think what's exciting about it is that many of the questions that I was hoping to kind of address in the, in that HIV story, I was able to historicize even more by having an older institution to work with. Um, it's a really wonderful question about kind of this tension between respecting people's privacy in conducting oral histories, but then also wanting to tell you, like, and really wanting to use that work to tell stories. Um, I would say that 
for the most part, colleagues have been colleagues have been extremely open with me. Where they haven't been has been kind of issues around personal safety and the ways in which these older histories can render them vulnerable in the present. Um, so the 1970s were a really complicated time in Uganda. Um, if you were a civil servant, it was entirely possible that you were rubbing up against state police in ways that were both legible to you and not legible to you. Um, and so really wanting to kind of err on the side of caution and not revealing those kinds of politics are really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about privacy. Um, and also kind of what it means to be a late stage cancer patient. And I think that, you know, if you, if you look at how differently Julie Livingston and I have like approached how to deal with these questions, um, I just decided that bodily states and experiences of disgust and despair um, were just kind of like no fly zones for me. Um, I'm just not that kind of historian ethnographer. Um, and I wanted to be able to write about those things. I wanted to write about what I saw with authenticity and care. Um, so I think there's a way in which the work that we do is as specific as the individuals that we are. Um, in, and I think that there is this kind of strange way in which being an ethnographer still means that you're a very particularly calibrated research instrument. Um, you know, kind of one with your own temperament and politics and kind of also just the ways in which you see things and, and make sense of it. Um, so a question about kind of the microcosm of the UCI and whether or not what, what we see in the UCI can be scaled to other cancer wars, was that kind of the general spirit of the question? Um, I, I would say that there is as much that's universal about addressing kind of the challenges of dealing with a sick child um, on a pediatric cancer ward in Uganda as a pediatric cancer ward anywhere else. Um, so I think questions of birth, life, death, suffering are very universal. Um, the politics of that particular place might also be particular, but um, the big questions I think are very uh, are things that you could really be writing about anywhere in a way. Thank you so much. So we have a question from Grace um, who asks about how these sort of prevalent Western constructive narratives about um, African disease burdens, right? Especially their focus on communicable diseases um, affect the Africanization of oncology as well as screening and treatment initiatives. And she writes particularly regarding the allocation of resources and agenda setting on the global stage for which health conditions are deemed a priority. Um, Olivia had a great question about the leadership of Idi Amin and how that affected oncology research. She says, from what you described, it seemed like he supported the advancement of Africanized or Ugandanized science. Did oncology research help to support his political rhetoric and bolster his regime? Um, and then we had a question from uh, Pete Hosing who says, I'm fascinated by how you navigate critiques of embeddedness and the like. And by contrast, I wanna point out that your emphasis on creativity is consistent with some of the most influential voices in studies of African traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. We should interrogate that, but it may be a longer discussion. In the meantime, another parallel between your work and the study of Ugandan traditional medicine in particular is your emphasis on shifts of resources and politics backgrounding the creativity that people must have to navigate these contexts. In relatively good times, like the new Hutch Center, how do you see the UCI bracing for the variety of future possibilities? Mm -hmm. In other words, can people consciously compose these flexibilities for the future, or is their creativity, as Livingston suggests, necessarily and fundamentally improv improvisatory? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to pronounce that right. Um, and then finally, we just have a clarifying question from Dr. Chambi Tushaje, who writes, um, about the translation of Saba Saba. Is it the same word from Swahili Saba as in the number seven? If that is the case, why was it chosen? Was the bomb issuing seven bombs at a time or even seven times seven bombs? He writes, as you probably know, Saba Saba is more of a positive word in Tanzania as it's a holiday and means July 7th, i.e. 7-7, seven, seven, which is a day when farmers have a festival and celebration showcasing their products in the market. 
Yeah, great, thank you. These are all really wonderful questions. Um, so Grace, you have a really great question about kind of how these framings of, um, <clears throat> or how kind of the ways in which we think of huh, how to tackle, I'm putting this in a tacky way, but you know, Africa is the place with communicable diseases and um, kind of the global North is the place with NCDs. How does that then shape the politics of resource allocation? Um, I would say that, I would say that Julia Livingston begins to address this really well in the first, um, in the first chapter of her book. And I would, I would draw your attention to that. Um, in the Ugandan case, I would say that an issue like cervical cancer is one of the spaces where you can see the tension between infectious disease and non-communicable disease management playing out very, very well. Um, so you might have cervical cancer vaccine campaigns for much younger women, you know, women who are considered to be kind of pre-sexual, you know, we're going to inoculate them from HPV and then cancers down the line. But what are we supposed to do about speculum allocation and pap smear allocation and kind of, uh, you know, different forms of doing cervical screening for this very large population of women who are prone to cervical cancer in the present. So there's that tension. Um, I don't really have data on that right now, but that's one of the immediate things that I can think of in terms of kind of where you see that complexity of like, where a non-communicable disease ends and where a communicable one begins or vice versa. Um, Megan Vaughn also should have really interesting forthcoming work um, on kind of whether or not there really is an NCD and epidemic in Africa or if it's always been there. Um, so that work should be coming out relatively soon. Um, a great question about Edie Amin and, uh, you know, kind of what, what did this institute do for him? Um, the ins this institute was like his tourist destination for biomedical care, like in, in Uganda. It was like, welcome to Uganda, let's go to Merchantson Falls, but also welcome World Health Organization delegates. We are going to take you on a wonderful tour of Ugandan biomedicine, starting with the Uganda Cancer Institute, where we have Africanized oncology. Um, so there are stories at the UCI over this period where it's like international delegates from the WHO, international delegates from the African Union, British visitors, American visitors, journalists. Um, this place was really a show pony uh, for kind of Africanization and its policies working in Uganda. Did he ever know that the NCI was pumping in the money for salaries and drugs? I don't know, um, but it is just a really interesting kind of, it, it, it is a really interesting politicization of this space. Um, so I think Pete had such a great question about traditional medicine and I'm gonna save that for a much longer conversation that I hope that we can have. But this question of like future possibility and what do we do with the fact that right now research is working so well as a resource. We have all of this new infrastructure. What are we going to do about it? I would say that in contrast to the 1960s, the vision is that Africanization is not one random person that you select who's brilliant from a class of 20 and then you send him to Bethesda and hope that everything works out. Now, the current leadership at the UCI is very, very invested in creating infrastructural redundancy. So instead of investing in one person, let us invest in five. Uh, instead of procuring one new radiotherapy machine, let us procure three. Let us think about actually diversifying this infrastructure so that we have chemotherapy treatment centers across the country, rather than continuing to deal with Kampala's storm drain. Um, and I think that that's, um, so I think that, I, I would think that we're moving to a space where people are more aware that yes, in the future, partners are going to come and partners are going to go, but what can we do to make this really robust 
and kind of shore up both humans and buildings um, so that we can weather those storms that will invariably come in the future. Uh, a great question about Saba Saba. Yes, uh, the Ugandan vernacular on this was to highlight this Uga was to highlight this Tanzanian day of celebration. It was just a way in which Ugandans referred to um, to Tanzanian army during this period and to these weapons. Um, I wish that I had been able to do work on the Tanzanian side of this. Um, and I'm really hoping that both Ugandan and Tanzanian colleagues will talk about this vernac will talk about these vernacular politics more um, because I'm sure that there are a lot of layers of it um, that just as Mzungu outsider I'm missing. Um, Andrew asks, could you give us a broader description of access to chemotherapy in more remote parts of Uganda? Do they have a different ideological orientation toward cancer and toward chemotherapy as a result of limited access? Um, Maddie Winter asks, how, if at all, uh, funding and research priorities uh, for cancer treatment have changed in recent years, especially as global health funding in the global south has historically focused on singular interventions for communicable diseases like malaria or um, tuberculosis. Um, and Hifsa asks, from your perspective, what has contributed to the idea that countries in Africa focusing on Uganda specifically are places of scarcity or regressive in regards to medical treatments and how can this false notion be overturned? Great questions. Um, so experiences of cancer outside of Kampala. Um, Lachor Hospital in the north in Gulu has historically been a place of cancer care. Um, when I was working there, when I was working in the early 2000, or kind of in the early 2010s, um, there had been a radiotherapy unit at Lachor Hospital in the north. Um, but that wound up closing down and the original cancer ward that they were using had been reconverted into a tuberculosis unit. There was a small Burkitt's lymphoma treatment center there as well. Um, but I would say that cancer like most, and if I would say, um, I'm not sure if Daria's work supports this. Um, I believe that Benson's work supports this, you know, that. And if outside of these like urban spaces of care, you know, your first reaction to a swelling or an ulcer is to assume that it's either some sort of misfortune. So I don't know to what extent you're all familiar with like John Jansen's work on the quest for therapy and kind of the way and therapeutic pluralism and the ways in which patients will go from kind of point A to point B to point C to point B to, you know, kind of back again, kind of in a map trying to find some sort of diagnosis. Um, so you'll have cancer patients going to healers, you'll have them going to Pentecostal churches, to dispensaries, um, to a wide variety of places before they might ever come to the UCI where it then kind of becomes cancer. Um, and again, Livingston talks about this, I would say very explicitly in Africanizing oncology. And I didn't see much different in my ethnographic work to suggest that the ways in which cancer becomes cancer are all that different. Um, this question about global health funding for cancer, is it getting better? Is it changing? Is it increasing? Uh, can global oncology is still a very, very small drop in the bucket. Uh, in terms of in terms of funding alongside say HIV AIDS malaria or tuberculosis that big holy trinity still very very low by comparison. Um, such a great question about why a medical setting like uh, Mulago Hospital, um, you know, has come to be framed as a place of scarcity. Uh, I would say that. This really is the million dollar, <laughs> you know, I would say that this is the million dollar research question for all of us who are going forward, which is how do we reimagine these places? How do we historicize these places? 
um, colleagues such as Steve Fireman, you know, would argue that there's always been extreme biomedical biomedical thinness, um, you know, in sub-Saharan in across the African continent. That biomedicine has never been this thing that somehow blanketed the continent in the way that you know the United States might be more of a biomedical space. Um, Biomedicine's always operated alongside traditional therapeutics, healing shrines, churches, um, broader forms of social health and spirit mediumship, all of these things in play. Um, I think that it is going to help us to kind of reshape our narrative as, uh, as US hegemony and global health declines. Um, because I think that we're going to, I mean, like, Sorry if there are colleagues who are from Hopkins here, you know, but I remember doing my master's program and they were like the best of the best, saving lives millions at a time, you know, that's the slogan of these institutions of, of the global north. And I think that we're all kind of looking around and saying, well, okay, wait, what just happened here in the United States in terms of coronavirus? And I do think that that's going to sh really change how we write about things for the better. Um. Thank you so much. Um, so we are, uh, we have one minute, but we're just about at time. Um, and we still have 28 questions in the Q&A. So that just goes to show how much of uh, an inspiring talk and an engaging conversation has been drawn from your work. Um, so we really appreciate your time, Dr. Micah. And I know um, I join all of my colleagues and just thanking you so much for joining us here today. Um, and again, I wish we could give you a round of applause in person, but I'll give you my little mini one <laughs> from my side of the screen. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to thank you again all for your hospitality and for being such a generous audience today. Um, and if any of you have a specific burning question, you should feel free to email me. Uh, and if I don't have the answer, I can direct you to a large volume of literature, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which will know the answer. <laughs> or the research question that you should be pursuing for your PhD project. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.